Hi, I'm Hope Dector, Creative Director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and I'm happy to be welcoming you to tonight's event, Survival and Mobilization, Mutual Aid in Migrant Justice Struggles, a conversation with Nikki Marine Baena and Dean Spade. Tonight's event is a continuation of the Building Capacity for Mutual Aid Groups workshop series, which started as a series of four online workshops led by Dean in, in uh, 2021 and 2022. In the first four workshops, Dean offered tools and insights for addressing common obstacles for people doing sustained work together to meet basic survival needs in their communities, addressing topics like consensus decision-making, burnout, bringing new people into the work, horizontal group structures, facilitating conversations about capacity and building trust. You can find links to our first four workshops, as well as video highlights and additional resources and events on mutual aid in the video description. And Sophie will drop a link to the YouTube playlist in the chat. Before we get started, I wanna offer a few notes of acknowledgement, thanks, and some accessibility information. First, a land acknowledgement. Tonight's event is taking place online, but we are all physically located someplace, and we recognize that all land is Indigenous land. Barnard College is located on the traditional ancestral territories of the Lenape people. In terms of accessibility, you can find a link to access live transcription for this event directly under the video on either the YouTube page or the BCRW event page. Thank you to Tricia Aldrich from Total Caption for providing the live transcription. Our ASL interpreters for tonight's event are Kat Ridley and Taylor Harris from Coco Language Advocacy and Consulting. Thank you both for providing this essential service. We are planning for tonight's conversation to take place for one and a half hours, ending around 8.30 Eastern Time, 5.30 Pacific. If you have a question for any of the speakers, you can type it into the YouTube chat. We'll be collecting any questions there for the Q&A that Nikki and Dean will do towards the end of the event. This event is made possible by the Patricia Weismer Professorship in Gender and Diversity at Seattle University. Special thanks to Natasha Martin and Teresa Ehrenfeit at Seattle University. I also want to thank my colleagues at BCRW for all their work including the two co-directors, Premla Nadison and Janet Jacobson, as well as Sophie Kreitzberg, Pam Phillips, Avi Cummings, and Miriam Neptune. Dean and Nikki reached out this fall looking to bring this important conversation about mutual aid and migrant justice struggles into the series of conversations we've been hosting about mutual aid. In order to give as much time as possible for the conversation, I will skip reading their bios, which you can find on the BCRW event page. I'm happy to welcome Nikki Marine Baena and Dean Spade to the screen. Thank you both for engaging in this conversation. Thank you so much, Hope. Really, really grateful to be here. Really grateful to Nikki for um, agreeing to have this conversation grateful to our ASL interpreters and captioner. Um, yeah, as Hope mentioned, this conversation emerged because um, Nikki and I met through shared networks related to prison and border abolition and specifically Nikki's work with Mi Gente. And we ended up having a phone conversation in September about mutual aid strategies related to migrant justice. And Nikki told me a lot of really exciting stories about her work in North Carolina, some of the things they've been trying and doing and learning um, that I thought felt urgent for um, us to talk about in this series um, with people in this conversation with us about mutual aid. So I have a bunch of questions that I'm gonna ask Nikki um, and get her talking about all that amazing stuff. Um, and then at the end, we'll open it up for people to share questions in the YouTube chat, which I can pose to, to Nikki or, or you can ask me questions as well. Um, so I just want to start with like what got us here. Um, I would love it if you'd be willing to talk about this range of mutual aid tactics that are being used in North Carolina, what kind of stuff you've been doing, why, what you've, um, you know, what the goals are, what you've been seeing happen. Mm hmm yeah, <clears throat> thank you so, so much for having me and thank you 
everyone that um, has helped put this event together. I'm really excited to be here and get to share about this. Um, so um, the <laughs> I think that one way to tell this story is that um, basically after uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ways to tell this story, but one way to tell this story is that I've been living in North Carolina on and off since 1999. My parents are immigrants from Colombia, and um, I got really much more involved with the immigrants' rights movement in North Carolina starting around 2010. And 2010 is also around the time that there was a uh, like pretty effective right-wing takeover of the state of North Carolina. So um in many you know and we've tried different things at different times but the part of the story that i think we're focusing on today starts around 2018 and what had happened in 2018 was that uh, people called it a wave a wave of black sheriffs got elected across north carolina and what many of these sheriffs did is they stopped collaborating with ice and so they stopped collaborating with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And what that meant was that um, people could no longer, it was harder for people to be detained by ICE agents in county jails. So when that happened, we all thought, this is great, a victory. Um, but then what happened as a response to that is that ICE started to come and do their own raids as retaliation. And they were very open about this. This They would do press conferences and say, this is in retaliation because the sheriffs won't collaborate with us. So we have to come and do it ourselves. And so for us um, at the time, I was working at Mi Gente and I was also a volunteer with this organization, Siembra NC. And so for us at the time, both on a national level and on a local level, a lot of what we were talking about is that panic seemed to be the point of uh, the Trump administration and the way that it related to a lot of different communities, but one of them being immigrant communities. Panic was the point. Cruelty was the point. These messages being told about our people and who we are and what we're like was kind of the point. And so uh, one of the things that felt really important to us on a local level was that people felt like they could live their lives without any fear, as much as we could make that possible. And so we knew that that was going to take all of us pitching in, including people who were really afraid. So what we started doing was a few different things. And so one was we would have um, just neighborhood groups, volunteers, knocking doors in neighborhoods. Because the way that ICE raids worked at the time was that uh, a car, you'd see a car that looked like a normal, completely unmarked car, and they would just kind of park outside of a trailer park, for example, in the early hours. And um, they didn't always have warrants for people. They would just kind of detain whoever they found. Sometimes they would have a warrant for someone, but they would still just kind of detain whoever they found. And so one thing was going to neighborhoods and kind of letting people know what, what to look out for. And so we had volunteer groups of people going out and knocking doors. And then um, we called these things uh, orchatazos because we would just hang out outside of someone's trailer park and drink orchata together and do like a know your rights workshop in their trailer park. And then we would do that so we would move many immigrant, many Latina immigrant folks in this part of North Carolina live in trailer parks. So we would just kind of move from neighborhood to neighborhood doing that. As we were doing that, we also had a 24 hour hotline that was run by a mix of staff and volunteers. It, we still have it, but um, so that hotline, people could call in and report rumors. And so, Part of our thing was don't do the thing where you hear a rumor on WhatsApp or Facebook and then you just keep spreading it on WhatsApp or Facebook. Again, because part of our goal is for people to not be afraid if they don't have to be. So um, uh, what we started doing is having people call the hotline with these rumors 
And then we would have a parallel group of people, we called them verifiers, who were trained to go and inspect the rumor. And so they would be like, nobody's there at all. Or they were trained to know how to talk to people in vehicles if they were there. And so I can show a picture of what one of those trainings looked like um, really briefly. Were they trying to confirm whether it was actually ICE? Right, okay. yes. So they were trying to confirm whether it was actually ICE. And then if it was ICE, um, part of our question was, do you have a warrant? And if they said that they were ICE, oftentimes they wouldn't want to talk to people anymore after that. And so people, we would train people to just kind of like very politely be like, okay, cool. Well, I'm just going to hang out here far away from you. But I'm just going to hang out right over here. And sometimes that was enough of a deterrent because they didn't have warrants for people. And so then the agents would just leave. So, um, yeah, I can show, let me see. And so here's like, in 2018, 2019, it's not just Latine folks, it's people from all over the place who would come to these trainings and where we would do kind of a different version of what we were doing in communities, which is here's what you're looking for. We're not trying to like get in the way of a detention, but we are trying to make sure that people know that this is being watched by people. Um, and I've been thinking a little bit about this too in the sense of part of what we were able to do in that time is in a time that people could have felt really helpless about what was happening, both immigrant folks and non-immigrant folks, just like there's nothing we can do about this, give them something that they could do about it. And so we trained hundreds and hundreds of people to be verifiers. And um, in 2018, there was a smaller raid in 2019, there was the biggest raid in the state's history. It was over 300 people in a couple of weeks. Um, but we were able to send out verifiers and like able to kind of, um, kind of like help people have a place where they could look and be like, wait, what's real right now? So that's and some of that 300 people that. raid happening in trailer parks. Yeah, and apartment buildings. Yeah, so the way it would almost always work, and this is still like, the way it would almost always work is that they would be kind of parked outside of a trailer park or an apartment building, <clears throat> and they might have a warrant for someone. And these are, by the way, administrative warrants. So I, Marisa from Mi Gente and I uh, get on a thing about like, this is kind of like if the IRS had a warrant for you, like it's not like a judicial warrant. So um, anyway, but <clears throat> they would have these warrants <clears throat> not signed by judges and, uh, but they would just kind of wait for someone, you know, that's the time that a lot of our people are going out to work five, 6 AM. And so they would wait outside and then just kind of ask someone, do you have your passport with you? And so it's like, it's really quickly it can become a conversation about like, I have reasonable suspicion that you're not a legal permanent resident of this country. And so you felt like some of the material like gains of this kind of tactic was both like getting people mobilized to actually be in community with each other and potentially reducing the amount of ice kind of stalking different neighborhoods and trying right. and apartment buildings. And did it, was it also about like knowing how to adv advocate for people who did end up getting arrested by ICE or like, how does it tie in? I'm, yeah, I'm curious mm -hmm. what else are people calling the hotline about? Like, I'm curious about the kind of whole picture of the work. Yeah. Yeah. So people call a hotline also for like what we call it resource and referral stuff. And so some of the stuff is like, my loved one did get detained. Uh, we don't have, <clears throat> we don't have money to pay for legal fees. Can you help us? And so what we started doing was with our members organizing fundraisers so that there's what we call the Immigrant Solidarity Fund. 
and people can go to that fund, apply and uh, get money to help pay rent, help pay bills, help pay legal fees. Um, and so it's like a member run process to raise money for it. And then it's like a member run process to help people find out about it. And then when people call the hotline and have these kinds of issues, we can help them with that too. Um, and so that's a thing that people call about. Sometimes people, people call because there's a lot of lawyers who will just take your money. So we also interview lawyers. Uh, we get, we kind of have a sense from like talking to different community members who have gone to different lawyers. Like, is this someone who like really helps people or is this someone who's just like really expensive? So we do that too. And so then when people call for these legal recommendations, we can kind of funnel them to like, well, these three people we've heard are pretty reliable. So that's another thing that we do too. During 2020, there were a couple different things that we did. So this immigrant solidarity fund, <clears throat> Undocumented folks were not eligible for any of like the financial assistance that people received during COVID. And so one of the th campaigns that we had was called Share My Check. And so people were invited to donate part of their stimulus check. And uh, with our members, we made a committee, the Comité de Fondo, where um, Basically, there were representatives from different counties and they made up their own consensus process around how to redistribute this money. So I have a slide about that too, because it's pretty cool. Was this fund statewide, all of North Carolina, or was this regional to the part of North Carolina you're in? This is regional to the part of North Carolina we were in and we worked in coalition with other funds. So there was like another fund in Charlotte, another fund in Raleigh, another fund in the West where the mountains are. And is your hotline also regional or is your hotline North Carolina wide? Our hotline is regional. And then there's a couple, similarly, there's a couple of other hotlines. So if we're like, oh, that sounds like a mountain thing, like here, you can call this hotline. Cool. Here, give me just a second. And so here's the picture that I have of this. So the Comité de Fondo, um, they did five rounds of distributing like money that mostly was donated in small amounts by people who just wanted to donate part of their stimulus check from 2020. They redistributed $375,000 to over 444 families. Um, and so... That was like a pretty cool process for them to fig figuring out how to do that, make those decisions with each other, struggle around the money stuff. So, yeah. Do you want to share any points from that? I asked this because one of the kinds of groups that I've worked with the most since 2020 are groups that raised money to redistribute in their communities, different kinds of funds. Sometimes it's just about a place like a city or a town. Sometimes it's about like a certain population. Um, but then a lot of them struggled with, well, what do we do if like, one person has such a high need that it would take almost all the money in the fund or all the money we have left, or what do we do when we're running out of money? Or what do we do um, when people have like, there's so many people who are like, who have a crisis that isn't gonna be fixed by one check. Like it's like, right. aren't, like they aren't gonna be able to pay their rent anytime soon because of illness or disability or, you know, just like, or they need, yeah. So like, I, I'm curious if, if you wanna share anything about kind of lessons learned or when it got hard. Yeah, there were a lot of things like that that got really hard. So. Uh, making decisions about, okay, we're going to try to, so the reason that they call it rounds is because they would try to be like, we're going to uh, not repeat people in a round unless there's like some really big emergency situation. And so then the round would close, a new round might open, and then they might be willing to like, so that was how they figured that out. But um they, it was there, were, there was a lot of struggling. And one of the things that we as an organization did, like the people who were staff and like really like kind of uh, more consistent volunteers is like take a step back from that process and let members run it. And so one of the things that was hard recently was that there was like a little bit of money left over in that pot. And the members were like, we have ideas for what we want to do with it. And some of us on staff were like, 
I don't love your idea, but it is your pot of money. And so like we did say that part of the stated purpose is that you all get to decide what to do with it. So there's been stuff like that too, where it's been helpful for us to be really transparent and really clear about like, there's other pots of money where we get to have more decision making, but the members really get to struggle with each other and have, have their consensus process about this. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you talked to me also when we talked on the phone about like the ice, like roadblocks and um, highway checks and stuff. Will you talk about that work that you all have been doing? Yeah. So that's the other thing that people will call the hotline about. So they're not, uh, they're not usually like ICE agents roadblock. What they do is like the sheriff will do it. And then uh, they do license checkpoints. And so if someone doesn't have a driver's license, that's enough of a reason for them to be like, okay, we're going to take you to the county jail. Once you're booked in the county jail, it's they can hold you until ICE agents come. Um, is that different than the participation that the black sheriff stopped? No, that is the thing that they stopped. And so there are the, like basically it's like in North Carolina, like you have uh, you have like 14 counties that are like hardcore. Like we are collaborating with ICE openly. Uh, there's a couple of counties. One of them is really close. It's the next county over from me, Alamance. Um, and Alamance is like the less famous, like Terry Johnson, who's the sheriff in Alamance County, is like the less famous Joe Arpaio. So it's like they both got investigated by the Department of Justice at the same time. Um, and so that's a place where it's like, oh, there's a license checkpoint outside the flea market on a Sunday. This is definitely about keeping people safe. It's not. And so people will call the hotline with those. And so at that point, what we can do is either say the checkpoint is a rumor. It's not actually there. Or we can say we sent a verifier. That checkpoint is very much there. Heads up. So that's some of the work that we still do with verifiers and with um, with the hotline. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also talked to me about this kind of like organizing people are doing inside their own trailer parks around the parking enforcement and some of these like very like organic sounding collective action approaches. I'd love to hear more about that too. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's been a couple of kinds of issues, especially kind of post 2020. Um, there's been a couple of kinds of issues that have really started to show up a lot more. One of them is housing problems. And so a lot of our people, as I mentioned, live in trailer parks. Some of these trailer parks currently are in places where property values are beginning to like really go up. So I'm talking about the county where Charlotte is, the county where Raleigh is. So these are places where, and even here in Greensboro, like one of the last trailer parks left inside of city limits got sold recently and most of the people who were displaced by that were latina immigrants who had bought their trailers but not the land and so they thought that what they bought was their forever home but um it's it's just like one of these things where it's like you know this shouldn't be you know this shouldn't be this way but um some of the stuff that started to happen Sometimes when there can be a couple different reasons that this is happening. Here's like my two anecdotal things, noticings about this. Sometimes it's when they want to make the trailer park owners want to make it fancier. And so they want to kind of, they want people to move out so that they can bring in fancier people. Um, and sometimes it's because they want to sell it eventually, but they can't say that yet. They're not sure yet. If you um, sell a mobile home park in North Carolina, you have to give the people who are currently living there like 180 days notice. So sometimes people don't want to do that. Anyway, some of the stuff that starts happening is that they'll have fines for all kinds of stuff. There's a fine because you left your kids' toys out in your yard. There's a fine because I don't like your window unit air conditioner. Uh, there's a fine. You, you see what I'm saying. Uh, one of the other ways that that looks is that the trailer park managers or owners will have a deal with a tow truck company. And so 
let's say that you, everybody's entitled to two cars, but if you have friends over, that car's parked outside, the tow truck will start making its rounds. So one of the things that people started doing is making WhatsApp groups just to be like, heads up, the tow truck is here. Some of these trailer parks are huge. There's like 300 units. So heads up from a total, like someone who would otherwise be a total stranger, the, tra the, the tow truck is here. Look outside and make sure that your cars are where they're supposed to be. And sometimes the neighbors have actually tried to circle the tow truck so that they can't leave. And so at that point, the tow, the tow truck operator has a couple different options. One is to like really just try to take this car anyway. One is sometimes to be like, all right, well, how much will you give me to leave the car here? And that's honestly still a better deal than what would happen if this car gets taken to a lot, because if it does get taken to a lot, then you have to have the person who's, uh, whose name the car is registered under, which is often not the person who's driving the car. So um, these kinds of things that have kind of organically emerged are also just ways that people are like, okay, like we're gonna draw the line right here. And so, and just to kind of say like, one of the threads for me in this is that living, having lived through the 2016 to 2020 period um, there was so much pressure to just, some people would still would say this a lot. They'd be like, I just go from work to my house and from my house to work. And so there was so much pressure to just kind of like um, isolate and like, and so part of what we were doing was this thing about not being afraid, but part of what we were doing was also just like trying to interrupt or disrupt people's sense of like who they could count on to not feel afraid. And so making WhatsApp groups for every trailer park so that they can communicate about whatever is going on. And like, I'm in some of these WhatsApp groups still where they'll be like, whose dog is that? And I think like just being able to have that level of like community building is so valuable. So I think that that's the other thing that I think that we were able to accomplish by doing that stuff. When you tell a story, it makes me think a lot about how many kinds of low-income housing are essentially carceral. Like we know that about shelters, that they're like jails, but also like the ex extractive and exploitive nature of trailer parks and those kinds of rules like that they can sell it out from under you and the fact that they can fine you for every little thing. And it really sounds like a prison setting. Oh, the guards are coming around. Who's right. going to get busted? And just this, this sense of collective action when people are in the kind of fear environment that the Trump administration attempted to produce for um, immigrants is really profound to me. And like, I think when people think about mutual aid, they might not think about like how much we just need to help each other, like break rules, survive really unfair situations where if we are individual, we're, we're not going to be able to beat it. But if we were collectively oriented, we might be able to get around some of these rules, like stand up to the landlord or whatever about the fines or about the towing like i also love this because i think in 2017 that picture really went viral of those people in tennessee surrounding their neighbor who was in his van when ice came to arrest him and just like i've just had this question like what makes that possible that moment like what do we need to be doing up to then so that when there's more and more opportunities either for people, you know, to lose a, to lose your vehicle could mean you lose your job, lose your kids. I mean, you know, it, that could, that could lead to deportation for some people, or that could lead to grinding poverty or being unhoused. So that's really important on its own, but also what I'm curious if you'll talk more about like what kinds of conditions you all are trying to produce through like the WhatsApp groups, what kinds of conditions are existing that you think have made some of the, um, solidarity that you've seen possible also part of what what makes it necessary i'm just like curious i'm just imagining people watching this event or watching this video later to inform organizing in their local settings like what um what do you think the ingredients are that help people break that isolation and and build more safety together hmm. yeah i love that question I think people want it, you know, like my experience has been that people want it. And you like as organizers, I think just like 
Yeah, like just like a totally different thing. Um, I live in a working class, mostly black neighborhood. Um, there's like a little bit of Latina folks, but um, last year we were like, you know, trying to organize the neighborhood. Um, and so we just start walking around and knocking on people's doors, especially in the summer. Lots of people are out on their porch. And it's like, what do you think about all the trash that the city won't pick up? And just like starting there, um, and people got really riled up about it. So riled up about it that, I mean, a few things happened, but <laughs> um, one, like they held a candidate forum for city council elections in the neighborhood. And so like, there's all these people, like this is not one of those neighborhoods that gets thought of as like, oh, they're gonna be super politically engaged. And so for people from this neighborhood to be like, what are you gonna do for my neighborhood? So that was one thing we did. Um, and then uh, we had like a neighborhood trash pickup where people weighed the trash. And it was like this whole family event. And then after that, um, but um, it's like people just started to come together more. And one of the big culminating events we did was just like a random holiday party. And we had people from the neighborhood come and we lit up this park that has no lights. Like it's like the park in our neighborhood isn't lit at night. So it's like we lit it up and it was so fun and people felt so good. And then that really got them like, we wanna do more stuff. So I think like one of my senses is like as organizers, as people who are like into mutual aid and wanna do volunteering, it's like sometimes it can feel like, no, there's no way people aren't gonna want that stuff. It's, it sounds weird. But it's like people want connection so much. Um, so Maybe yeah. about the Young Lords Party tra garbage offensive, you know, in the '70s, where they they there are these young people and they're they want to do Puerto Rican liberation work and they want to liberate Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. and also decolonize Puerto Rico and they're they want to you know follow the lead of the way the Black Panther Party is organized and they're like, what should we start with? And then they like talk about in that that famous movie that um, Iris Morales made. Um, Palante, Sabre Palante, they talk about how when they asked all their neighbors what they were upset about and they all were like, we're upset that the garbage doesn't get picked up in our, in our neighborhood. Um, and they were like, that doesn't sound very, you know, glamorous, but they know. You know, was the garbage offensive where they threw all the trash into the road and blocked the road and they went, they like stormed the city um, parks place where all the bags and, and brooms are kept and like took them to like kind of show this ethic of like this um this kind of revolutionary politics like that stuff belongs to us and we're taking it like they took their really militant work but did it about the thing that like just the folks in their neighborhood cared about and it's like so parallel to the story you told and, and such a key central point of organizing is to be like what are people willing to get riled up about it may not be like people may not be most riled up about the thing that like the organizers are thinking about it might be something yeah. that you know and the whole point of this is to have people like build together I just love that's, you. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I, it's well, I love the Young Lords. I love that story. Um, uh, so I've been deeply shaped by that. But I think it's like when we can tap into like what's on what's in it, like what's at the bottom of it for us, which is often our longing for connection, then it's like we can we can join that with other people. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's that's been like a big, big thread for me in a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like right now, some of the stuff that we're seeing where it's like you were asking about like create conditions and right now, one of the things that we're, we're getting a lot of calls about it on the hotline, but where we're looking to see if people get more riled up about it is wage theft. A lot of people are calling us and saying like, my boss did not pay me what they owe me. And we're like, cool, what do you want to do about it? So... <laughs> If you can find three or more people going through the same thing, we have ideas about what you can do about it. And so that's one of the things that we've been doing lately. And then similarly having a model of like, we're going to go to neighborhoods and talk to people about how to protect themselves from wage theft. Because there's a lot of stuff you can do. Uh, I mean, if the person's going to try to steal your wages, they're going to try to steal your wages because that's part of their business model. But there's a lot of things you can do so that you at least have proof so that if it comes time to press like press them on it, you have what you need. Mm -hmm. I've been moved by the stories of this group that's existed for a long time in Seattle 
called Seattle Solidarity Network that has approached wage theft and also like landlords not giving back deposits or things like that through direct action. So because it can be really hard for many reasons, people are rightfully scared to go through official channels or official channels are you know often designed to be on the sides of landlords and bosses. So instead they do a lot of like protesting at the landlord's house or the boss's house or business, like really direct. Yeah. And I think that similarly, this this kind of, I, it's also mutual aid work, but it um, it's a lot more culture changing and it also is much more participatory. It's not like we, you have to find a lawyer and see if you can win in this system that's stacked against you. It's like, oh no, we can all just do it right now. Something unfair yeah. just happened to our people and we're just going to not take it. And like, I just think that's a very different like capacity building for the community than, um, than hoping the official systems will take care of it when we know they usually don't. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, that's been really similar to our experience with it in the past. Like, and I think, yeah. So I, I just worked with a group of <clears throat> sewers and so, and they had gotten their wages stolen. And then like the main person who was really riled up about it got really good at getting a bunch of other people riled up about it. So I was like, oh, you have some organizing chops. So it's like, and then one of our members in that community, this is like a rural community in North Carolina. Uh, one of our members got really good at like listening and asking questions. So this is like the intake where normally like, oh, like, but it's like our members can do intakes now because they're going through this process. And so, yeah, like exactly what you're talking about in terms of the capacity building aspect of it. That's so cool. We talk a little bit about how conditions have changed. Like um, obviously part of what you're talking about is, is the, the Trump era. I'm curious what is different under the Biden administration for your work or, yeah. you know, the initial period of COVID versus the current ongoing period of COVID or, um, I don't know, maybe other things like it could be that particular wars or particular th condition, country conditions happening are bringing different people to the U S fleeing different things. I'm just like, I just feel like you have a lot of depth and I would love to hear like any of those things you've noticed. And some of them may ring with people in different regions um, who are watching. Yeah. So one of the things that we saw here was kind of random detentions went way down. And so uh, kind of the stuff I was describing earlier, where like a random person who's a worker gets detained, that stuff has gone way down or we're receiving way less calls about it at least. What we know is happening a lot, because this is what we get calls about, is um, like my son got detained at his probation hearing or at his probation appointment, his meeting with his probation officer. Um, lots of that kind of call. And so what we know about that is that there's different kinds of law enforcement, ICE collaborations. So even if Part of the reason that people talk about sheriffs a lot is because sheriffs are elected positions and the rest of these law enforcement positions are generally not. And so trying to understand how, why people get detained at probation is pretty complicated, but it can be really frustrating for people to be like, well, I was doing the right thing. Like, sure, I made a mistake, but then I was going to my, like, I paid the fines. I went to the class. I was going to the meeting with the probation officer and then I got detained. So it creates a lot of frustration with like law enforcement. And on top of that, I think it's, it's just kind of like what law enforcement does for other communities, but like it's, it's this additional layer of immigration enforcement on top of it. So that's one of the things that we're seeing a lot of, and we're trying to understand what to do about it. And so we're trying to figure out, like, is it that we have volunteers who accompany people to their probation hearings? Like, and that's the thing that we're just trying to kind of do, try it out, see what happens. Um, for a lot of the people in the communities that we work in, COVID was a very brief thing. Like, they had to go back to work really quickly. And so one of the things that we ended up doing, there were some people... Uh, there tend to be like different kinds of like, for example, here in Greensboro, a lot of the people that we know work in construction. Uh, that's true in uh, the people that we know in Raleigh, the people that we know in Winston-Salem, the people in Ashboro, which is more rural. <clears throat> a lot of those people work in factories. And so those factories were like not safe places to work. 
um, there was no, <clears throat> no like social distancing being encouraged. And so some of the people that we knew were really afraid to go back to work. And so some of them managed to find ways to like, because a lot of that work is textile, they managed to like build a shop in their garage and do their work and then bring it in once a week. But we actually ended up starting briefly like a mask business because we were like, oh, an opportunity. You don't have to go into a factory and people need masks. So <laughs> we started a mask business. I think like our second biggest customer was the local teachers union. So they did all of our prototyping with us. We we're like, does that, do you like that one? And they're like, no, again. And we're like, do you like this one? And so then we ended up doing that for a while until people felt safe enough to go back to work. But at this point, it's like, yeah, people don't really have the choice to stay home for the most part. Mm -hmm. With the, It's interesting with the, I think, I've always had this question with know your rights framework, you know, because it's like, that dilemma of like you tell people what their rights are on paper with the cops or with ICE, like it's not actually what the cops guys do. It sounds like in versus telling people what to expect and whether there are any workarounds, you know, and also like that some of our tactics don't keep working sometimes. Like sometimes we try something and for a while it makes some of the people, makes some of our opponents stop enforcing something, but then they just start enforcing it harder. I'm just curious if you have any like takes on that, how you mm -hmm. all figure out when you're advising people or when you're creating curricula, like how to make it realistic and actually beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like <laughs> with the know your rights stuff, that's a good example of like, uh, or, or wage theft. Right. So we're like, it's not here. We're not going to like give you a whole thing about all of your legal rights when it comes to your wages being stolen. What we are going to say is, these are the top five red flags that we've seen of this person may steal your wages. This is how to spot that kind of um, guy. Basically, it's like, they're usually guys. But like, this is how to spot that kind of uh, employer. And then this is what you can start doing if you think that this is the situation that you're in. And so it's always like trying to be like, this is what you can do. You can start a WhatsApp group with your people. This is what you collectively what we collectively can do. And so I think that trying to have things that are that, like always have a thing that's like a thing that you can do, a thing that we can do, is a way that we try to kind of like stay on our toes about it instead of like getting too mired down in like, yeah, like different things that, yeah, like laws that law enforcement violates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like a lot of what you're talking about and what's inspired me so much about hearing about your work is, 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 you know, the fundamental idea of collective action, like kind of all we have is a lot of people, they have all the money, they have all the guns, they control all the institutions, like, you know, and I'm, I think a major question about our movements right now is how we can increase our capacity to stop the state from taking our people. So I see that also, like, you know, in every city I know of, the, there's a really in, increased intensity of um, people living unhoused and then and then police raiding parks or places where people are camping and doing these, you know, street sweeps or whatever. Um, and this question of like, can we do more than help people pack up? Could we ever stop these sweeps with our bodies? And, you know, you saw this in 2020, people being able to stop arrests by having enough of us pulling people off or you know, the, the folks in that in that famous picture from 2017, stopping their neighbor from being arrested by ICE. I feel like a lot of your work is giving me more inspiration about that question than a lot of what I hear about. And I wonder if like, just like, what's your take or like your, what are any lessons learned related to that kind of fundamental project we have that I think is still not fully in bloom at all in our movements in the U.S. of like, um, what is it going to take for us to like get in the way of the state each time they come to raid or sweep? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've also been curious. I mean, so I'll get, I'll get to what you're talking about in a second, but I've also been curious about like one of the things that we also started doing is <clears throat> um, many of our members are people who have had a loved one detained at some point. And uh, 
So when we have when we get a call about a detention, we try to go with one of the people who has had that experience before. Because it's like it's one thing to hear from me, hi, random nonprofit staff, but like to hear from someone who like has had that experience too and be like, hey, you can call me whenever you want, like is another one of the things that we do to like um when we train people around the hotline and around volunteering one of the things that we like really emphasize is like telling people you're not alone, like you're not alone. And so that's the other thing that I've been curious about with what you're talking about um, is like, I don't hear much about, this doesn't mean it's not happening, but I don't hear much about like, what are the projects that people could do around accompanying people who are locked up and accompanying their families? And I think that that's something that we've figured out ways to do that I, I think is like a lot of people could do that. Um, and so going back to your question about what's it going to take. I just feel like we tell people that they have a role to play in stopping it, and then we make stopping it look really kind of fun. Um, I really think that that's a big part of it. Yeah. There's some part of this that is a numbers game. I mean, it. I don't know what the next phases will look like as our opponents. If we were to bring the huge numbers to every sweep and every raid, I don't know what things they would unleash. But right now I'm like, they're just very few, there's just not enough people showing up to any of these emergencies in our communities. There's so, so many things demobilizing us. There's so many good reasons, but I, I just do have deeply have that question. Like, could we stop sweeps in a given town for, you know, a long period just by turning out 1500 people at each sweep, you know, like what would the cops do next? How would that escalate the struggle? And I don't, I just have a lot of, you know, because I've yeah. seen people trying. Well, what's the minimum number, right? Like, is it is it 20 to 50? Because, I, I mean, we could get 20 to 50, right? <laughs> and then partly it's an element of surprise. Like, I think that, you know, when they raided um, Echo Park in 2021 in Los Angeles, where, where people had been uh, camping and building a really beautiful mutual aid, you know, sort of um, community and giving a lot of support to each other for quite a while, uh, I think a lot of people showed up to that, but the cops mm -hmm. spent a million dollars I and mean, it was fully militarized. Like, and that's not how every sweep looks. And so right. I think that's another question is like, what are the different, what are the different moments look like? Right. You, um, you're part of me, Hente, and you all have released this, um, tool that a lot of people are talking about. Um, Andrea Ritchie and Miriam Kaba very centrally featured it in their recent, um, uh, document about this question of the role of the state to abolitionists. Sophie, maybe you can put that tool in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm talking a little too fast. Um, this tool from Mihente um, talks about sort of understanding our tactics or in as, as like three pronged work that is against the state, work that is beyond the state, and work that is within the state. And I was curious if you, I know you worked very closely on that tool. If you could talk about like why you all created that tool, like what it's trying to address, what you think the it's contributing to the conversations about our movements. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the framework in that tool, the, yeah, beyond with, I love that you said beyond. I feel like we always struggle with that one. We're like without, outside. Um so I love beyond, um, beyond within, <clears throat> against. That framework comes from the Movimiento de Pobladores en Lucha, the MPL in Brazil, in Chile. And so, um, but trying to, you know, one of the kind of internal, we're very, en mi gente, it's like big, high school debate club energy. So <laughs> one of the big debates sometimes is like, <clears throat> we're super inspired by some of the Latin American leftist stuff. Um, and um, how does it, how does it kind of translate to our context here in the US? So I think that that was part of the reason that we wrote that tool was like, okay, like if we're just thinking about what 
alternatives to the big institutions and to things like capitalism and uh, kind of these hegemonic systems, like what these things look like. And that part can take people a while to wrap their heads around. And then I think that, you know, you and I have talked about this, but <clears throat> the within the state work, the electoral work gets so much attention, especially in the last few years. Um, and I think to the, at somewhat of a cost to the other two kinds of work. So at somewhat of a cost to against the state work, which can be, you know, protesting the state. And I think what I would also say, like corporate campaigns, things like that, uh, we've seen less of that. And I think we've seen less attention to community building and mutual aid efforts. And so that was part of the reason that we wanted, like, even at Mijente, we spend a lot of time on within the state work, but trying to be like, that's not, it, it doesn't take you through your whole life or your whole year. And so what are the other parts that are also really important if we really want things to change? Will you describe what you mean by corporate campaigns? Yeah, I mean, campaigns that target a company or a corporation. And so I think we see some of that, for example, in the climate movement of like, we're going to target this bank. Um, but I feel like I'm old now and I feel like we used to see so much more of like, oh, like um, campaigns against different corporations or campaigns against, or many of us were in conversations around things like the World Bank or the World Trade Organization, that kind of against the state thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, um, one thing that is interesting, I've thought a lot about Mijente's approach that that, that three-pronged approach and like like on the one hand I feel like it's potentially very helpful because sometimes inside organizing communities it becomes like a pitched battle like if you've done any electoral work then you're dead to me and I only you know or if you did if you did defund work in the city council that's too statist for me or you know people are doing a lot of drawing heavy lines or your work is immature because it's trying to defund the police okay. and I'm going to fix the police or you know whatever so as people who already know that we're abolitionists, um, how do we contend with the fact that these different kinds of work have different costs and benefits? That my critique of the Mejente tool would be that I wouldn't want people to read it and think all three kinds of work are similar or like let a thousand flowers bloom because of course the dangers of within the state work are you know this kind of intense co-optation problem we've seen our whole lives, um, and the risks of against the state work are so high and beyond the state, right? Like yeah. people being criminalized for doing food projects on squatted yeah. land, or for um, or for trying to stop people from being arrested, or for protesting at landlords' houses, or for burning cop cars. So how to like name all of the um, the, the fact that these things all might be necessary in the social movement ecosystem, mm -hmm. but that there is always so much weight on the insider work. And that's the work we're all being told is legitimate in the United States, like by schools. And it, that's the story. Yeah. And, and the other work is being told is like criminal or terrorism. And so it's like how to build that framework in a way that pushes people to um, to more solidarity with criminalized okay. or stigmatized tactics. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, just to kind of complicate it a little bit, I think, but like, um, here's what I think a lot of people are not talking about openly, or at least not that I've heard, but like in the time, in the last, what, 10 years that we've seen more organizations get into, like more progressive organizations get into electoral stuff in my lifetime. I don't know how many have been fined by the board of elections at the state level or by the FEC in like big ways because like to them, you know, to them organizations like Mijente are outsiders. And so we're not supposed to, like, I feel very proud of some of the nerdy stuff I did in my time. Like, I was running finance at Mijente, so I had to learn campaign finance law to do the reporting, which is very complicated on purpose 
to make it so that our people can't participate fully in this process in the way that rich white super PAC, you know, can participate. And so I think that there is something about like, and we don't talk about that because it's shameful or because it makes us look like we don't know what we're doing, but like, that's, you know, it's not the kind of like criminalized repression, but it's another way to make sure that our people just don't, can't get through the door. And so I, I agree with you in terms of like, part of the reason that we think that this stuff is important is to like, we can't, we can't do electoral work at the expense of everything else. And so I think like, especially with the beyond the state stuff, sometimes I feel like we're fire keepers, you know, like it's like, it's a tradition. I really like the Cindy Milstein, the, the, what is it? Is it A is for Anarchy, the recent one? But it's like, this is a lineage. And I think in this moment, I think it's really important to like tell more stories about the lineage and get it out there. Um, I'm alarmed by how many 18 to 25 year olds I'm meeting that their first big political thing is like canvassing with the Democratic Party. I think that's work for us to do around like, especially younger people and how we can get them in. But I guess that that's how I think about that. And so it's like, yeah, my organization does electoral stuff. And I think it's also super important that, to keep these little fires going too. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate you saying that too, because I meet tons of young people who've only heard the story that social change happens through elections mm -hmm. or policy work, which doesn't leave most people much to do besides occasionally try to get the vote out or something. It's not... Um, you end up feeling like, I don't know, there's, it's a, it's harder to, it's a, it's a, it's a narrow lane of possible engagement. That's different than trying to stop tow trucks in your neighborhood, you know? Um, and I think stories about how social change really happens are like sanitized in the U S so mm -hmm. intensely to boil it mm -hmm. down just to elected officials or just to courts or legislatures. And so how do we keep that fire where we tell the stories of our communities and also like your work just relentlessly invites people to like collective self-determination with their neighbors or coworkers. Um, that's so different from like joining something that's hyper organized, like an electoral campaign, even though that might sometimes be strategic. But if you, if you think that's the only political action possible, and if you think like I will be saved by like AOC or Bernie, you know, like that, it's, there's a very like, pacifying yeah. story about government that um that i think is very dominant in the u.s and and people crave something else and in 2020 a lot of people got a taste of something else mm -hmm. but haven't necessarily figured out how to sustain it with constant community action between insurrectionary moments yeah yeah i remember this is making okay a couple of things one it's making me remember that in the early siembra days so before the it was just at the tail end of the first raid in 20, what year was that? 2018. I'm like, I was pregnant. I was so hungry. But OK, um, as the raid was ending, a tornado happened right here in East Greensboro. This is a mostly working class black neighborhood. And the city of Greensboro takes days and days to do anything about it. So some of our friends who are um, black organizers in that part of town were like, you know what's holding us up? Chainsaws. And so we were like, we know who has chainsaws. And so <laughs> we just started posting in all of like these like Facebook, like Latine, like they call them like flea market groups because people are just buying and selling stuff. But like, we were like, hey, if anybody wants to come out and help us clear tornado debris, we're going to go do that. And so we have like two or three like chainsaw brigades where we just have people come out with their chainsaws. And like some people drove from like two hours away because they were roofers and they didn't have anything to do that weekend. And they put tarps on people's roofs, something the city was just going to take its sweet time doing in the springtime in North Carolina. So um and I, so that's one story that I think about in terms of like, right now, right now, let's go. The other part of it, that there's something in there about, 
I live in North Carolina. We may have lost indefinitely, right? So the electoral people that I know are like, this looks very bad for us, for the, for the foreseeable future. I still think that it's our job to offer people, and I don't mean job like a thing I get paid to do, but like truly my life's purpose and many of the people around me to like offer connection and dignity to as many people as we can get to have that, even if the right wing takeover is forever and ever. And so I, I do believe that we can find ways to live collectively and live with dignity no matter who's in power. And I think that it's really important for us to not lose sight of that. That's really beautiful. Yeah. And our strategies and tactics change when there are different administrations in our city government or state government or county government. But the that like it's the crises are, are you know permanent. We have a question. Um, someone asks, I'm gonna read this. I understand and I'm totally on board with mutual aid as a strategy that has multi-dimensional implications. And I wonder if you see it as a goal on its own or as a means to an end. If it is a goal, I wonder if you think it's sustainable in our current political economy. If it's a means to an end, how would you articulate what this end looks like? Is it more in the realm of abolition or non-reformist reform of institutions? like defunding strategies, mm -hmm. socialism, or something else. Ooh. Juicy. Yeah, provocative. Um, okay, I, I think it's yes both ways. Um, <laughs> yes to both. So one way is that it is a goal in and of itself and sustainable, we're, the way we kind of, approach this is like we, the sense of we are always trying to get people together, doing meaningful stuff together, taking collective action. What around for how long changes based on what the need actually is. And so in that way, it does feel sustainable um, because it's not like we just keep you know, like there's a lot of people I know who do grocery distribution and I think that's really important and awesome. But I think that if you just did that over and over and over again, I might not think that it was sustainable in our current political economy. But um, so I think the fact that we kind of switch up, like what feels relevant to people right now, what are people willing to do right now? Um, makes it Makes it feel like it can just keep going. In terms of if it's a means to an end, I feel like different people that I work with would have different answers to this. So I feel like not an official mi gente answer, not an official siembra en si answer, but a lot of it for me, some of the way that I got into a lot of this stuff was through work or cooperative businesses. And what worker cooperative businesses did for me, both working at them and then helping other people start them, was like, oh, wow, we can demand democracy in our everyday lives, not just once a year when we, whatever, every four years, but like, um, but that there could be ways that we expect that from each other. And so to me, the means to an end is more and more places where more people who, by the way, many of them are not allowed to vote in this country can expect that they can negotiate relationships and negotiate democracy with other people in their lives. For me, that's the end. Yeah, I I, I think that um, when I read this question, I think about how the contemporary ways of living that we are being forced into are totally unsustainable. <clears throat> and so our resistance activity and our survival also like it's a high bar to imagine that they would feel sustainable because yeah, like right. the, just the conditions we're living under are like you know um ecocidal or whatever so given that we're fighting hard like while the ship is sinking and hoping we can have some people survive and have new ways of life that that are not extractive 
and and brutal. And so every movement that's ever existed that has been fighting for some kind of liberation has had to do that combination of attacking the systems that are hurting us, trying to survive while we attack them, trying to have enough people coordinate with each other enough on those shared goals of attack and survival. So to me, that's what mutual aid is. There are people in our movements who are doing mutual aid as part of a desire to build like nonprofits and political parties and and stuff that they hope will take over Mm -hmm. the existing state structures. And there are people who are trying to um, do mutual aid to build a society that doesn't have um, states. Um, that's, you know, I put myself in that category. I, I aligned with an- anti-state or anarchist ideology. But mutual aid has been used in like <laughs> movements doing all kinds of things. Like the right wing also uses yeah. mutual aid in, in its um, really scary movements. So mm-hmm. I think that mutual aid as a, as a tactic isn't necessarily tied to one political end, right. but I do think that anarchism has mutual aid as a central um, belief about how all life, like we believe we should actually organize life through like collective self-determination horizontally instead of having new people take over the existing hierarchies and decide how we get our basic needs met. So that is like a big difference between like people who want to take over the state and people who want to um, abolish the state. And those people are often working together right now because we might have shared aims like prison abolition or border abolition or ending a particular kind of pollution or, um, you know, eviction or whatever. Um, But this, yeah, this is a really juicy question that I think people would differ on that also relates to the mihente tool like how, what's the balance of what we do that's like the within the state work yeah. versus the against the state work <clears throat> depending on what we're going for and i think like all the coalitional groups that i've been in that sound like the ones you're in people are like creating space for that debate ultimately yeah like that's what's cool about it is it's like let's solve this immediate problem and talk and while we do it let's let's talk to each other about what we believe things should be like and what could fix things and what happened in this other place or this other time. Yeah. Yeah. And just like, I I think a lot about in 2020, we were one of the only groups. So this is like the Mijente electoral campaign in North Carolina. We were one of the only groups that um, had a door knocking program in the 2020 election in North Carolina. Cause a lot of people were like, oh, we'll do phone banking. And we were like, we're going to talk to people. Like we're gonna go. And I think it, part of the reason that we were able to do that is because what we were up against if we lost for our people in that time felt very real. And so I think that's, this is one of the other debates. It's like, what's the threat right now? And what, which of these prongs will help us get, move something about that threat. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I think there might be different answers for different people, depending on your region or your county or your city or your neighborhood. Like just, we have different targets or different political opportunities. That's like a very complicated assessment. That's right. Maya asks um, if you would talk about Mijente's funding and what considerations you all take when you think about how to fund your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't speak too much to how it's funded now. In my experience, so Mijente has a C3, a 501C3, a 501C4, and a PAC. And it's a mix of foundation grants and individual donations. Um, Yeah. I think that what considerations, I think that a lot of the reason that Mi Gente was funded was because of 
kind of noticing how the immigrants' rights movement stalled out during the Obama administration and having a very sobering realization of what kind of scale we were going to have to build in order to be able to like win real changes for our people, both at local and state level, but also on the federal level. I asked Sophie to put in the chat um, this webinar that we did as part of this series that might be interesting to some people here about like how to decide if you're a mutual aid group, whether to try to get a 501c3 or get a fiscal sponsor, or, you know, if you take money in through Venmo, how to figure out how you're going to pay the taxes. Just like the, there's a lot of like very practical dilemmas about funding, even really local, tiny yeah. work if you're, if you're handling money. Yeah, that's awesome. There's also a question that is asked that is, uh, what do you think about the concept of third places? I don't think I understand that question. Do you understand that question? I've heard of this concept a little bit as like um, spaces where people have like engagement or conversations, but if the asker wants to add anything um, to that, the chat, we will go deeper with it. Or, or if you want to educate us about um, the question, that would be really welcome. I'm curious about like what you're anticipating, you know, like what, what have you been, I, I think of you as you have had many years in many parts of the movement, like what are you expecting? What do you think we should be preparing for and how? Okay. <clears throat> when <laughs> this is, I, I feel like I'm really in my I'm really in the weeds lately so I feel like uh lately I've been really thinking a lot about North Carolina I think if I I'm trying to like take a second to like I think we're a little bit stuck, right? And I think that, and, and when I say we, I think like uh, the U.S. progressive left, but I think we're a little bit stuck. And I think that I don't think all hope is lost because we're stuck. I, I think some some of my friends are like, all hope is lost. It's over. Um, and just like what it means that you, what does it mean to be stuck? What are you and your friends saying about being stuck? Um, I don't, you know, part of the thing about the electoral work and some of the ways that it's started to take up a lot more space in the last few years is that a lot more conversations are about winning. And I, I, um, came into this work as an anarchist. So I think like I've had to move into accepting the role of elections in my life somewhat more than I used to, but I used to have much more of like a, we can't win. Like we're not gonna win against these people. So let's just make the not winning awesome. So, and I, and I in this conversation, I'm apparently still that person, but like, um, But I think that when I say stuck, I think it's like not seeing a path forward, but also not being okay with being where we are in the path now. So to me, that's what I mean by stuck. Um, it's like if, if your car got stuck in the mud, you have options. One is to just stay in the car. The other is to kind of start walking around and being like, what's here? What's, what, do, what can we use that's here? And I think that that's part of what I've been trying to really do for myself and invite the people around me to is like, I don't know, is that, is that nettles? I don't know. Like what else is in this area around where the car broke down? And in that sense, um, as you know, I was just in Colombia where the left is currently in power in a way that is not just all dreamy, everything's fine now <laughs> but it's also like wow like people did this over many years and like um 
the kind of imagination that it's taken and the kind of like really throwing down together and the kind of like really making weird alliances like <laughs> i think that is so inspiring to me and i think that i do try to hold on to some sense of like incredible things are happening in different places and so even though i think that in this moment we're a little bit stuck i think like trying to bring in inspiration from the outside and trying to see what we can use from the stuckness is kind of what i've been trying to focus on um and i say that because i don't know that i see like a path to winning either either in the sense of like what you were talking about which is how do we make our lives more sustainable or in the sense of like in a place like north carolina how do we overthrow the right is the stuckness about the power of the right wing in the U.S. or will you describe the conditions that that you think of as this car being stuck? I'm just very surprised. I mean, you know, like I'm very surprised by how we have to remind organizers that at the end of the day, most people just want to live well. And I think that's part of like the uh, I don't actually think winning equals living well. And I think that sometimes, to your point about elections, like sometimes you can win an election and people are not living any better than they were before. And sometimes we can do a lot without, you know, a corporate campaign or without a, thousands of dollars of canvassing to change how people feel about their day to day lives and their community. And so, so to me, I think like that this thing that to me feels a little bit like this is the central thing. The, the central thing is how do we have dignity and connection? I feel like we're very disconnected from it as a movement. And to me, that I think is some of the stuckness. Mm -hmm. I feel like I think of the stuckness as the levels of isolation mm -hmm. that people are under and how demobilizing that is. So how do you it's really hard. We, we yeah. People have been deprived of any real stories about how social change happens and given a lot of myths that are about some other person will do it. You don't need to. You just sit home and give money or post on social media. Like that feels like a hard isolation and demobilization. And then people are paying like higher rents than ever and are like isolated by having to work so much. Um, and People have lost a lot of social ties because almost everything happens online, especially yeah. once COVID started much worse. And so those things I feel really scared about just in how the quality of life of people I know has really dipped in a short period. And then I, I worry that a lot of resources are put towards winning things that don't help that much. Like getting one socialist on your city council, I can say from experience in Seattle, yeah. does not stop the police budget from growing. What does is like an enormous number of people organizing together. So I think I feel worried about conditions that are affecting all of us, including yeah. people who care about this politics and even see themselves as social movement participants, like that isolation and that mythology about change that that discourages collective action and all the like skills it takes to do collective action like talking to people who aren't like you and yeah. going to meetings and being uncomfortable or bored um going to parties and where everyone isn't like you know all of this these are skills that like our entirely online lives have have made yeah. it harder yeah no that's right that's right there's another question. Um, could you expand on what you mean by the immigrant rights movement stalling out under Obama? Um, we were hustling for our people. Are you referring to the mainstream movement space or the general US populace? Uh, no, we were for sure hustling for our people. And I think that the assessment from my compass is that um, at a certain point, regardless of how much mobilization uh there wasn't really more that we could advance right so we could not advance on comprehensive immigration reform and we could not advance on dapa and so like uh so i think what i mean is in spite of how many people were hustling so hard every day 
it, it became like we didn't have more people who could hustle harder to get more of the things that we were hoping to win. Yeah, that's such a big question for movements. Like when our opponents figure out how to stop responding to our tactics, like what new tactics do we need? Um, that's so hard. There's another question too. Could you talk more about the against the state work? You mentioned briefly that this work can cause harm to the people doing it. How do we ask people to put their bodies on the line for others? Is there a differential cost to this for different people with different identities? Hmm. Trying to, trying to remember. Yeah, so when I was talking about against the state work, generally, generally we think about that as like campaigns against specific elected officials or against um, state policies or different kinds of policies. Or um, I extend it sometimes to like work against corporations. So targeting a corporation to make them change a policy. Um, I don't remember, do you remember what I might've said about causing harm to the people doing it? Maybe I said that, um that this were that again, I think I was, I think I should have, I should have spoken maybe, maybe beyond the state is the category that I was thinking about. Like when people do riot or when people do, um, uh, you know, engage in sabotaging a pipeline or, you know, like there's some of this, some, some social movement work is criminalized. Some of the most effective disruptive work that might save people's lives in our communities is more dangerous than going to the city council hearing. Um, and so just naming that for me, that that's a call to solidarity. So like, cause what can happen in our movements is that people who are using more palatable tactics join in and saying like, in judging or uh, stigmatizing people who have used more militant tactics. And that has been a brutal nightmare in the history of our movements in terms of people getting criminalized. So I think that was what I was, maybe that's what Maya is referring to. Yeah. I mean, that thing about, can we ask people to put their bodies on the line for others? I, I have almost every time I teach my law and social movements class, when we talk about a critique of pacifism or we talk about criminalized or stigmatized tactics, students will say, well, people can't do that if they're undocumented or people can't do that if they're um, you know, from more criminalized communities or if they're people with disabilities. And I just have to say like, those are the people who mostly do it. <laughs> like the people who've taken the biggest risks in all of our social movements historically for liberation have been the people who need change the most right. and have the least to lose if the system changes. And so the question for me is not, will those people do that? They do. <laughs> the question is, how do we all protect those who take those bigger risks, whether they have those stigmatized identities or not? Right. Yeah, nobody has to take those risks if they don't want to. But when movements, when, when conditions are desperate, People take those risks and they're much safer if we have more people who believe that's legitimate resistance and and don't be snitches and don't be, you know, calling the cops over, hey, I just saw this person do graffiti during the protest or, you know, people act really co cop in the heads thing, um, yeah. even inside our movements because we live under this narrative that um, we should only be peaceful protesters and that people who take bigger risks are irresponsible or they're all outside agents or, you know, there's just a lot of um, really harmful myths that have caused a lot of political prisoners to not get the support they need, including people who were arrested in 2020 and are still facing charges, but have mm -hmm. criminal history or other like greater levels of vulnerability. So to me, the answer to that is, you know, obviously no one can make anyone else use a tactic that they don't want to use, but we should have the backs of everybody who uses the most dangerous tactics for liberation instead of judging. Yeah, no, yeah. We, in the early days of Siembra, you know, DACA got canceled. What was that, 27, 2017? And we wanted to have a march, like um, not a direct action, not a, a march and people, uh, we're like, that's so dangerous. And we're like, we'll talk to the people who want to do it. Like, 
about what they want to do, you know, like, but it was, it was really strange to have like, and I think that there is this thing about, you know, you were talking about like how the stories that we tell and the stories we hear in school about how social change happens and about like, not talking about the risks people took and what those risks meant at the time, you know, what Fannie Lou Hamer did, you know, like all of these people who like took really serious risks and, um, and are doing that now. But, and then instead it's like really, people are freaked out by really light stuff. Yeah. Um, Someone asks sort of a follow-up question to this about hearing about differential cost for different people of different identities mm -hmm. and are people charged differently? And that I, in my experience, yes, like cops and prosecutors upcharge people of color, people who they think are isolated or who have, um, uh, who they can better criminalize. Obviously there's different risks if you have a uh, more vulnerable immigration status you know, prison and jail can be more risky for trans and queer people. I mean, there's people with disabilities who need medications or care that's going to be denied there. Um, no doubt, like the whole system is aligned at every stage, but you know, who they pick up, then what if they pick up a lot of people, who they keep, what they charge them with. Do you want to add to that, Nikki? Oh, you're muted. I was just thinking too about like, um, you were, I think you were talking about this a second ago, but then kind of how that ends up aligning with like, sometimes when we end up in movement spaces, replicating some of the messages we hear other places about like, well, then that person shouldn't take those kinds of risks. And it's like, well, that's really not my decision to make for other people. But I think I hear, I hear stuff like that, where it's like, well, that person shouldn't get arrested during a riot. And it's like. Yeah. I also hear, I, I hear a lot of people being like, social movement organizing is for privileged people. And that's because the media is lying and is always telling a story about, you know, like white saviors and heroes or only showing mutual aid if it's upper class people doing, I mean, we like, we have to just have a lens. Like obviously the people who do the most work around crisis are those in crisis. That's the way it is everywhere and with every crisis. So we have to have a critical reading on Anything that tells us that um, social, because it's it's an anti-social movement message. It's like, oh, that's just a privileged thing. Therefore, we should all just take it and like not to make change. Any last words, uh, Nikki? We've got about two minutes left. I don't think so. Thank you so, so much for this space. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Thank you for sharing your very beautiful work. So much gratitude to um, the ASL interpreters, the captioner, Sophie and Hope, and everybody at BCRW for creating this space and everybody who shared wisdom in the chat. This video will be around for folks to use in the future. Thank you, thank you. You're muted, Hope. Sorry, I should know this better by now. Um, I just wanted to come on and just say thank you so much, Dean and Nikki, for bringing this conversation, um, which is so urgently needed. And um, it was really amazing to get to hear about all these different actions, uh, Nikki. So thank you for bringing all this to, to everyone's attention. Thank you so much and good night to everyone. <laughs>